All right, our next speaker, our next speaker is Rick Smolens. Rick is an old friend of mine and an old friend of this conference, and I first met him when he mobilized a world full of photographers to launch his uh, famous Day in the Life series. He and his partner, Jennifer Erwitt, are also creators of other unusual picture books, such as America 24-7 and 24 Hours in Cyberspace. And by the way, you can see Rick's book and all the other books published by various speakers who will appear on this stage in our bookstore upstairs. I strongly urge you to pay it a visit. Today, Rick is announcing a new era in computational power and insight, including possibly massive invasions of our privacy. In other words, he has news from us from the frontier called Big Data. Rick Smolin. Oh, I need to grab the clicker. I don't know who's got the clicker. But if someone brings that to me, but I can start without it. Um, I probably have, I think I have the best job in the world. Um, uh, when I was 24 years old, I got hired by Time Magazine. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, I'd done the yearbook in high school and college, and I couldn't believe I actually was meeting prime ministers and renting Learjets and, and hanging out with these incredibly famous older photographers all over the world. Whenever I showed up anywhere, what also kind of astounded me is that even though I worked for Time and somebody else worked for Newsweek, when we weren't actually out in the field shooting, Everybody looked af after each other. It's like a big family. People would make sure that you could borrow a lens or if you needed film or you needed to know that the bus was leaving early the next morning. When I spent time hanging out in the bars with all these photographers, I wasn't a drinker, but if you're a photographer, that's where you pretty much hang out when you're not shooting. Um, all these older uh, men and women, I was about 10 years younger than most of them, would sit around and bitch and moan and whine and complain about their editors. And I thought, I am so lucky, I can't believe we have the coolest job in the world and you guys are just like whining all the time. And I realized what was going on is that all of us wanted our pictures to change the world. We hoped that we would not be just documenting things, but that somehow our pictures would shock people or move them to try to right a wrong or to unco uh, uncover something that needed to be talked about. So one day, I was sitting around with these other photographers and I said, wouldn't it be cool if we could all get together and I do a project on one day, like a day in the life of a country, just us, no editors. So all of my older, wiser friends sort of patted me on the shoulder and said, okay, kid, you go organize it and tell us and we'll all come. So I went out and I met with 35 publishers. I thought they'd fall over the brilliance of this idea that 100 of the best, best photographers in the world let loose in one day. I was living in Australia at the time, so that's where the first book was gonna be. I got laughed out of the offices of all of these publishers. I said, what a stupid idea. Who on earth is going to buy a book for $40 with a bunch of pictures taken by your friends on the day that nothing happens in some godforsaken country like Australia? So I went to the prime minister, who I'd photographed a bunch of times, and said, would you pay for this project? And he said, yeah, nice try. And I said, it's going to be good for you. And he said, Rick, I, we're not going to give you the money to do this project. He said, but I will help you. And he had a great idea. He said, I'm going to set up meetings for you with Fortune 500 CEOs. And I said, I'm trying to do a photo book about your country. Why do I want to talk to all these business guys? And he said, okay, stick with me here. He said, you're going to ask Qantas for airline tickets and Kodak for film and Steve Jobs for computers. And I said, they're just going to give me this stuff for free. Why? He said, because you're going to put their logo in the front of your book. And I said, I can't do that. I'm a journalist. That would be selling out. And he said, Rick, Rick, it's like a PBS special. You know, the following program is brought to you by... So um, I'm going to give you a little uh, sort of sneak preview of these projects and explain how it relates to the new project that we've just done. So the first books we did were these Day in the Life books, much to everyone's astonishment, especially the publishers who'd said no. This became the best-selling photography series in publishing history. We sold almost three million copies in a market where there was no market for coffee table books. Day in the Life of Canada was our third book, which is really fun. We lived here in Toronto for about three months. Um, Every one of these books got incredible attention. And then after a while, doing a country in a day got a little bit old. It was sort of, okay, we solve these problems over and over again. <clears throat> My father, who worked for a drug company, <clears throat> excuse me, said, why don't you do sort of a day in the life of medicine? I said, dad, I'm really sick of the day in the life thing. He said, but, and also who wants to look at a, 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 you know, a book of people in hospital beds, you know, sick? And he said, no, no, if you actually did this, you took your team of photographers, instead of um, a country in a day, did a deep dive on how the human race is learning to heal itself. 
he said it would be really interesting. It turned out to be absolutely fascinating. And it set us off on a new course, which is doing deep dives in emerging topics. So the first year the internet was touching our lives. You know, I love, Don's presentation was fantastic. But if you all remember the first year that we were hearing about the internet, it was all gloom and doom. Where we were saying, oh, the world's gonna end. It's a better way to deliver pornography. People were writing it off as just another little fad. Obviously the internet, and it's only 20 years old, which is extraordinary. So we've looked at the global water crisis, the internet, the microprocessor. And something that never occurred to me in a million years, having been turned down by all these publishers, was that um, when you invite photographers and editors and writers from these magazines, they all go back to their editors and say, I just worked on the coolest project. And suddenly, we sort of backed into this you know, am amazing publicity. Every project we ever did got, the, the media loves doing stories about the media. You know, it's very self-referential. Um, and then the died in, in heaven gone to moment is this in publishing. I'll just show you two seconds of this. One day when I was just going through the bookstore, one of my favorite things to do is to go to the bookstore. <coughs> Y'all heard? Okay. So I found this book. It is a great gift. It's called America 24-7. It is uh, from New York Times, number one best-selling authors, Rick. Uh, anyway, I, I, I just wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> the point is it basically it doesn't get any better than that in publishing. And you know, God bless Oprah for making people read again and talk about uh, you know, literature, um, unlike some of the people we're hearing about that aren't reading books anymore. Um, so um, I go to Idea City every year. I go to a lot of these, you know, big tech conferences. I go to TED every year, and uh, I always sort of ask my much smarter friends, like, "What's going on?" I sort of listen. I I feel like you know, I'm sort of this quiet person in the room listening. And and uh, Marissa Meyer, who's now the CEO of Yahoo and is an old friend, I've known her since she was about 23 at, at Google, and she's helped us in a lot of our projects. Again, one of the smartest human beings I've ever met. I ran into her at TED two years ago, and she said, "So, what's your new project? What are you working on?" I said, you know, I don't know, there's just nothing that's been sort of grabbing my attention. And she said, you know, you should look at doing a project about big data. And I said, what's that? And she said, well, some people believe that we're watching the planet develop a nervous system. And I said, wow, that's really cool. What do you mean? And she said, well, all of us with our smartphones, with our ATM pass, our Google searches, the, the cost of now generating and gathering data and analyzing it in real time, we've never been able to affordably put sensors all over the planet. We've all become human sensors with our phones. And the ability to actually collect that data and visualize it and understand what we're doing and change our behavior while it's still happening is something we've never seen before. And she pointed me to this great quote by Eric Schmidt, the chairman of, of Google, this idea that from the dawn of humanity to 2003, the human race generated five exabytes. Now, even if you don't know what an exabyte is, and I don't, um, the, the fact that we're now generating that much data every two days, it's a straight vertical line. So it just gives you a sense of the enormity of the sea change of what's going on. The second thing is that the cost now of grabbing this data, of, of measuring the planet, of sensing the planet, is plummeting. Everything has sensors in it, even our bodies now. I mean, th this sounds sort of metaphysical, but you'll see in a few minutes, this is happening everywhere now, that the ability to collect data on every aspect of human behavior, and actually every aspect of life on Earth, is, is getting so inexpensive, and the ability to now process it is also plummeting. Now finally, my friend Esther Dyson, who's also a wonderful uh, an investor and a writer and a thinker pointed out to me that we used to be the center of the data universe. We used to put sensors out there, collect the data, and get the results back. These sensors, which are now being spread in the billions around the planet, are starting to now change their behavior based on each other. So we're no longer the center of the data universe, which reminds me a little bit of like Skynet. You know, it's like, are we going to even be relevant in the near future? My friends in the media until about a year ago, whenever you saw this phrase big data, it was always followed by big brother. Now, um, having been a journalist for many years, there's this, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, if you can make something scary, and, and there's certainly very scary things about big data and the collection of data, as we've all heard about in the last week with the NSA and what's being done with the collection of data about individuals. But I think that just the way the first reaction to the internet was hysteria, the sky's falling, oh my God. Whenever there's a new technology, I think people often jump to, what's the worst thing that can be done with this? And I tend to be a glass half full kind of person. Um, my first curiosity is what can I do with this? What, what, how is this gonna actually help us as a species? Um, my son is 10 years old. And uh, very often um, I put the kids to bed. I often snuggle with him and we read together and then he falls asleep and I usually fall asleep with him. And I wake up at you know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning and I go back to work in the kitchen. And one night about two months ago he walked in and he said, Dad, every time, of course, he asked for a glass of water. If you have any kids, you know, they're always looking for an excuse to get up. So he said, Dad, every time you're on the phone for the last few months, you're always, you're always saying this word big data on the phone. What does that mean? 
and I'm thinking it's two in the morning, and I'm still trying to understand what big data is myself, and I was like struggling for an analogy, like how do you explain this to a 10-year-old? And I said, Jesse, imagine if your whole life you've been looking through one eye, and suddenly for the first time in your life, you're able to open a second eye. You're not just getting more vision, you're not just getting more vision and data, you're actually getting a different dimension. You're seeing things that are in front of you, but you could never see them. You couldn't extract that third dimension before. So he thought about this for a second, he said, so can scientists let me open up a third eye and a fourth and a thousand eyes? You know, if you're 10 years old, a thousand eyes is so cool. And I, and, and, and I said, you know what, Jesse, you're right. We can actually open up a thousand eyes now. That we, Our technology now is allowing us literally to open up a thousand eyes and have a thousand, literally a thousand sense of dimension and see things that were in front of us that we'd never seen before. So um, I'm gonna uh, show you a couple of, of stories and tell you about this project. We sent 100 photographers around the world to 30 countries. We looked at all these different areas of human endeavor. We, try to, we, look, we looked at possibly 2,000 assignments and came up with 100 assignments for the photographers. Incredibly hard. Of all the projects we've ever done, this idea of how do you visualize this idea of data. And by the way, I think we are today in the world of big data where the internet was in 1993. I think we're, we're in the caveman era of this. And I want to show you sort of some of the things we discovered. Um, this is um, a little video that explains In the near future, did. every object on Earth will be generating data, including our homes, our cars, and yes, even our bodies. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the amount of data we're exposed to. Our 15th century counterparts experienced less data in their entire lifetime than we do in a single day. Our smart devices are turning each of us into human sensors. We now leave a trail of digital exhaust, a perpetual stream of texts, location data, and other information that will live on forever. But who owns the data we generate? Who profits from it? And why are governments and corporations the only ones thinking about the impact of big data? In glorious photographs and moving essays, the human face of big data is the story of how our planet is beginning to develop a nervous system, one that each of us is part of. The human face of big data captures an extraordinary revolution sweeping almost invisibly through every facet of our daily lives. If you thought the internet changed the world, just wait till you see what big data has in store for us. So my, my brother, my younger brother Sandy, is a film director, and he always says, uh, when you open your books, he said, imagine you walk into a movie theater and, you know, Batman's hanging out of the airplane, the bad guys are shooting at him, the plane's crashing. He said, before you even roll the credits, you sort of grab the audience. So he said, when you do your books, why don't you open them with four big, bold ideas, big photographs, big thoughts, and then, then you basically hook your audience. And so I've been sort of taking a page out of his book. The, the first image here is Times Square. And I love this idea. Basically, the idea is that in the Western world today, those of us walking through Toronto are exposed to as much information today as somebody from the 15th century was exposed to in their entire life. I mean, again, a straight vertical line. The second thing I love is, I love this picture. It looks like an old, you know, chiaroscuro uh, painting. This idea that the human, that, that in the first day of a baby's life, that the human race is generating 70 times the information contained in the Library of Congress. Again, just a straight vertical line in terms of the amount of data that our species is generating. My daughter is 13, and in three years, uh, there's two things I'm worried about. One is dating and one is driving. Um, not necessarily in that order. Um, and um, there is an automotive uh, company now, an automotive insurance company that will put a little tracker in your car that will measure how fast you drive, where you drive, how quickly you change lanes, what part of town you're driving in, and they'll lower your insurance rates if you allow yourself to be tracked. I actually want to know where my daughter is every single second of the day. And there's, there's this trade-off of privacy and security that I think all of us are dealing with, this idea of, you know, we're, we're creating this digital exhaust that's never going to disappear. So if any of you are ever planning to run for office, remember that everything you do is being stored forever now. And then finally, we've all seen the incredible effects of po on po politics, this idea of open data is amplified by Twitter and Facebook. I want to share some of the stories real quickly of my sort of my favorites that we learned in this project. Um, when the earthquake hit in Japan two years ago, terrible devastation. The only journalist that I heard talk about the data component of this was a guy named Kai Rizdal from Marketplace. And he said that 14 seconds before the earthquake hit, before the earthquake hit, every bullet train, every factory in Japan came to a halt, stopped. Imagine if, if you've been on a bullet train moving at 200 miles an hour and the earthquake had hit. They spent $500 million over 15 years installing a dedicated, hardwired ser series of sensors all over Japan that detected a wave that comes just before the violent wave. It worked, it saved lives. 
What fascinated me even more is a group of entrepreneurs in Palo Alto, California, realized that the accelerometer that's built into all of our laptops, if your kids are running through the kitchen and they trip over the power cord and your, your laptop's on the way to the floor, there's an accelerometer in your laptop that knows it's falling and it knows to lift the head off the platter to try to save your data. Well, these guys in Palo Alto said, wait a second, we could use that same accelerometer and use it as a, as a free, ubiquitous, worldwide, global earthquake warning system. And so you've got a half a billion dollars on one side, 15 years, on the other side you've got something that costs nothing that people are using existing sensors in their machines. My kids love this one. Um, they're actually putting uh, sensors on um, large mammals in the South Pacific to measure uh, temperature, water currents, migration patterns. When these animals get closer to one of these transponders on the right, there's 60 of these all over the South Pacific, the information goes out of the head of the animal, into the transponder, up to the surface, and up to a satellite. So the idea of using animals to help measure the planet is very cool. Imagine if you got your American Express or Visa card tomorrow, and there was no itemization, no breakdown of what you spent your money on during the month. Is there any way anybody in the science would pay a credit card without being able to check what you spent your money on? Obviously not. But every month we get an electrical bill and we have the faintest idea what it is we're paying for. And, but we pay it because otherwise they turn off the power. So Sweetak Patel is 27 years old. He's a MacArthur fellow. He started three companies, 27 years old. Sounds like he's one of Don's uh, graduates. And um, he came up with a little chip which he just sold to a company called Belkin. You plug it into your house, anywhere in your house, one place, and it recognizes the digital signature of every appliance in your house. And I said, that's so cool. And so you can, on the iPad, you can see oh, my hair dryer, my dishwasher, my toaster oven. I said, but you still have to pay your bill at the end of the month. There's just something that you learned that would surprise the average person. He said, yeah, we found out the average person in Canada and the United States, 11% uh, of our electrical bill is the DVR, that little box that records Desert Housewives on Thursday night. And it sits there the rest of the week spinning away, 11%. So instead of building another nuclear power plant or digging another oil well, and here's an insight we just got from his technology, maybe we could actually redesign the damn DVR and actually cut our electrical consumption by several percent. When people look at crime data, uh, the first thing they look at is where the crimes are committed. Well, a woman at Columbia University said, what other data is here that we haven't been paying attention to? And she looked at where the criminals lived before they went to jail. And she came up with something called million dollar blocks. The idea here is um, Mayor Bloomberg in New York spends a million dollars a year to incarcerate people in every one of those buildings. So maybe since putting people in jail for 20 years doesn't seem to turn them into model citizens, maybe putting early childhood intervention or career counseling or you know, drug kind of counseling, something to try to stem the tide. I'm going to go very quickly through these because I'm almost out of time here, but half the drugs in Africa are counterfeit. So you need penicillin or antibiotics, you walk into a pharmacy, you can flip a coin, you have a 50% chance that what looks like legitimate pharmaceutical medicine is actually completely counterfeit. So this guy came up with this idea, his name is Bright Simons, of a little scratch off code that you could SMS and it tells you right away, is that medicine actually uh, penicillin or not? My kids love this one too. Um, around uh, airports, radar operators for years have been looking at um, the, you know, they've been trying to filter out birds and bees and bats and insects from the weather data and from the radar data. And it turns out that a group of scientists said, what, you've got 15 years of migration patterns and you've been throwing it away, a bat migration? So we're finding over and over again when people share this data across different industries, they're getting a lot more value out of it. Two more quick stories here. Um, my mom is 90 years old, and my dad passed away six years ago. And my mother insisted on living alone after he died in the Keys. And she fell about a year after he died, and it wasn't too bad. And then she fell again six months later, and it was worse. And then she fell the third time, and they didn't find her for five hours. We kept begging her to move in with us, and of course, she's very independent. She wouldn't. So I hired these women to live with her in shifts. She hated it. They're stealing my garbage bags. It's like, Mom, they're not stealing it. <laughs> So um, I found out that um, General Electric and Intel are working on a series of products aimed at aging at home. One of them is called the Magic Carpet. So they put this carpet in the home of your loved one, and it basically says for the first week, it just says, it's not making a value judgment, it just says Rick's mom normally touches the carpet at 9.30 in the morning. This is her balance, this is her gait, this is how fast she moves. And on a day where it sees a different pattern, it can actually predict two days before someone falls that they're going to fall based on looking at muscle weakness. Now this is not a product that hasn't come out, it's a prototype. And um, then I found out about these little devices. This is the Jawbone, uh, the up band by Jawbone. 
this is part of the quantified self movement. So this is the gamification of health. This measures how I sleep, how many paces I take. It's not for sick and old and firm people. I can actually compare myself to my buddy Gene here in the front seat, in the front row, because we can actually see how we slept the night. I walked more steps than you did. Actually, he walked more steps than me yesterday. Dean Ornish, uh, who's a, a wonderful doctor in Palo Alto, California, talks about the fact that right now in America, we're spending 18% of our GDP on healthcare. And most of that spent in the last six months of someone's life. You know, years before we were in an ambulance on the way to the hospital, our body's been giving off all kinds of data and signals and we've not been paying attention. So a lot of people believe that devices like these that start creating these patterns, individual patterns for each of us, will give us a chance to actually find out there's something wrong early, really early on in the process. One last story and then I'll, I'll jump off the stage. Hugo Campos has a wireless pacemaker and throughout the day it, it sends his data to his doctor. So like me, he's kind of a quantified self, you know, fitness guy. And he started measuring his alcohol consumption, his sleep, his diet, and he wanted to map it against when his pacemaker kicked in. So he called the manufacturer and said, can I get a copy of my heart data? And they said, oh, sorry, sir, that's our proprietary data. And he said, what are you talking about? This is my heart's been creating, generating all this data. I want a copy of it. And they're refusing to give it to him. So the question here is, it seems like large governments and corporations are, looking, are using our data, collecting our data, trading in it, but we seem to have very little say about who's getting the data and what they're doing with it. And I think it's a conversation we need to have right now. The reason we did this project, The Human Face of Big Data, is I think that all of us as individuals need to be really aware of what's going on. What happened last week with the NSA is probably still just the tip of the iceberg. This is gonna become a new asset class and we need to protect this as a, 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 it's, a, it's like a right. We have the right to our own privacy and our own data. And we should be able to decide who gets it and what they do with it. Thank you so much. Moses, thank you. Thank you again yes. so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank wonderful. you. Thank you.